rolling now, so fire away. All right, so for the American audience, could you uh, please uh, tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? Uh, my name is Jordan Carter. I work in Wellington for an NGO called Dimsa NZ, where I do lobbying on public good internet issues. Um, I spend a lot of my time, my spare time, being a Labour Party activist, and I write a political blog called Just Left, which is well known as a Labour sort of aligned blog in the New Zealand political blogging space. Um, that's kind of a summary of who I am. <clears throat> We can move the table a little bit out of the way. So. <laughs> it's, it's pretty sweet, it's peaking at 12. <clears throat> peaking at 12? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, That's okay. So could you tell me a little bit about why you started Just Left? Well, I was away for three months in the UK and started 2004 and I was running a travel blog. Um, and when I got back, I sort of was reading blogs here and the political blogging balance was really biased in favor of the right and there were a few left-wing blogs like No Right Turn, but none of them were particularly friendly to Labour. They were liberal left blogs or a huge dominant of right-wing blogs. So I just thought, well, I've got the resources, I've got the time, I might as well um, make some effort to help write the balance in favour of my party. Um, <clears throat> what do you think the role of the, uh, of the media is in New Zealand politics? The role of the media? Yeah. Um, not as dominant as some people would give it credit for, I think. Um, I think we've got a strangely non-aligned media in a political sense. The newspapers tend to be more parochial and provincial than in a lot of countries. And um, generally the news reporting is moderately straight down the line, though I'd argue with a slight conservative bias. Um, obviously, during an election campaign, it is the key forum for getting messages out, and so political movements spend a lot of time trying to shape, especially what the electronic media says. I think the print media is less important than radio and especially television in New Zealand. But um, in political life and campaigning, the TV in particular plays a really strong role. So, um, is there a problem? I'm just refocusing. <clears throat> So, could you tell me, uh, do you think that the blogosphere is uh, beginning to have more of an impact on New Zealand politics? More compared with when? Uh, say, three, mm. three, five years ago? Definitely, more than then, yeah. The last election in 2005 was the first where I think blogs were something that was paid attention to by media. You had things like newspapers publishing extracts from random blogs they'd chosen. You had journalists looking to political blogs for leads on stories or um, sort of unfiltered activist opinions that they'd never get from the mainline politicians. Um, and I don't see that role as having diminished since then. I'm not <coughs> too sure it's increased all that much, but um, I think it'll remain you know, moderately significant. <clears throat> um, how does uh, conservatism in New Zealand differ from American conservatism? Oh, I think it's a lot more liberal, <laughs> to, um, to put a tag phrase on it. New Zealand right-wingers tend to be conservative in the sense they want a smaller state, and they want lower taxes, and they want less economic role for the government. But you don't get the kind of tie-in generally with religious politics that seems to me to scar the conservative movement in the United States. And you also don't seem to get, I think, that kind of... You know, I think New Zealand politics generally is more laid back. People are less militant on either side of the divide. But I think the key difference is the less, lesser role of religion in New Zealand conservative politics. Now, you work mm. at uh, Internet uh, NZ with... Uh, and I believe that also David Farrar mm. works there as well? He's the chairman of the Public Policy Committee there and until recently was vice president. Yeah, so I've been working with David there since <coughs> 2004. And, 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 yeah. and you two very arguably yeah. have very popular blogs on different sites. He, he's a national supporter. <coughs> You're a labor supporter. Do you ever go out for drinks or you know talk shop or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we the work we do in NZ is a lot of social contact after meetings and so on. And um, David and I get on remarkably well considering that difference. He, um, 
because he's one of these, he's an example of, I guess, the ultimate extreme in New Zealand's right-wing politics, where there isn't, he's not very conservative. He, he's sort of libertarian or liberal. Like he wants less tax, less government, but he's not into, you know, trying to control what people do in a moral sense. Um, and I'm obviously a moral liberal as well. So on that kind of dimension of politics, we don't fight. Our fight is about the role of the state and what actually freedom is, whether it's freedom to have opportunities or freedom from taxes, essentially. So um, we have some lively debates, but um, you know they're always civil um, and they're always in a context of respecting that <coughs> each of us has a different point of view. Each comes from a mainline political party um, that has a place in New Zealand politics, which is unusual. A lot of our friends don't get it, but. Um, it just seems to work. Yeah, does the media get it? Uh, when people report about uh, blogs in New Zealand, in the media, do, do they, do they kind of understand uh, what's going on here with the media? Or? I don't think that it's so widely known that David and I get on quite well, that we work together. And I don't recall seeing any um, coverage that sort of highlighted that point. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what they would highlight, to be honest. These two guys work together in the daytime and argue it out at night. I don't know if that's um, if that's newsworthy. If it is, I haven't seen it reported. Um, so, how much influence do you think third parties have under MSP? Third parties. Uh, minor parties mm. in Parliament. Oh, um, well, certainly a lot more than they did under first past the post. Um, they have probably got influence now that's commensurate with. The number of votes they get, or maybe a little bit more. There's a that whole argument about the tail wagging the dog, about a small party with a few seats really bossing a big party around. I don't think we've seen that in New Zealand politics. I don't think we've seen that kind of political paralysis that might emerge where a small party was trying to take too big a bite of power. Not even <clears throat> New Zealand first. Well, certainly not in recent times. No, I mean if you look at the current arrangement between Labour and New Zealand First. New Zealand First has some significant policy gains in terms of pension levels, in terms of the gold card for pensioners, um, in terms of extra police recruitment. But they haven't tried to and haven't succeeded in really changing Labour's direction on fundamental issues of economic or social policy. And I don't think any small coalition partner whether to the left of Labour or the right, or New Zealand First when it was in coalition with National in the 1990s, had succeeded in doing that. <clears throat> now you said uh, that you're a Labour activist. Yep. Uh, what do you do uh, to support Labour? Oh, a whole bunch of things. I was a campaign manager here in Wellington Central at the last election. Um, I sit on the party's regional council in the Wellington region. I sit on the party's national board as a gay and lesbian rep. Um, I'm a elected party-wide to the party's policy council. I chair the party's economic policy committee. So I have a, a range of roles, a range of hats that keep me pretty busy. <clears throat> and um, so, do you think that labor, uh, and to, uh, also national, but do you think that labor has changed from more of a big tent, broad spectrum party to a more focused party now that there are uh, parties like United Future to the right of it and parties like the Greens arguably to the left of it. Uh, do you think that's enabled them to really hone in on their core support? To an extent, yeah. I think the, the difficulty with that analysis is that under first past the post you needed 45-48% of the vote to win an election. Whoa! And under MMP you need about 40% of the vote to win an election. So the scope to narrow in the, the focus on voters isn't that huge, um, and the main parties still need to take a reasonably broad tent approach. But I think that you know it, it does provide some ideological comfort, the fact that there are other viable parties to left or right of either of the main parties, that they don't have to appeal to the more extreme elements of what would have used to be their support base. Back <clears> in, um, hold on, I'm just gonna wait for this breeze to die. That's fine, I can't even hear it. Okay. Uh, back in, um, uh, before MMP, hmm. first past the post elections, it was usually a national government. Uh, Labor got it very rarely. Um, 
uh, I believe it was four four times uh, from the end from 1949 to 1993. Yeah. And then um, after MMP. Labor has been in, in the government. There haven't been many elections, but three out of four elections have resulted in a Labor-led government. Yeah. Uh, how do you explain that? I think what happened is that from the 1970s, with the emergence of the Values Party, um, there was a, a high third-party vote in New Zealand. I think the main party vote went from a high of about 95, 96% in the 70s, and it coasted down from there. So by the 80s, you were seeing regularly 20, 25% of the vote going to third parties. And the majority of that third party vote was to left wing parties, either to Values or to um, the New Labour Party when it emerged, um, to the Alliance and so on. I did a back of the envelope calculation once, and from 1975, <clears throat> National only, like the right in New Zealand politics, only won more votes than the left in 1975 and in 1990. So what we had was an electoral system that because of the fragmentation of the left vote, <coughs> because of Labour's disintegration in the 80s, was delivering right-wing governments with a majority of left-wing votes. Um, and that, is, that was the driver for the change in the electoral system. So I think that the old system was cheating the progressive left in New Zealand through the left's own failure to organise um, its party system in a way that maximised its electoral return. So the MMP system, because it makes almost all votes relevant, um, took away that problem. It meant that we <coughs> didn't have to try and make the Greens and Labour and New Labour or the Alliance-type coalition all fit into one party when they were actually a lot happier being outside it. And it gave centrist voters choices that weren't just national if they weren't quite comfortable with Labour, parties that Labour has proved able to deal with. So I think the structural change has been very much in favour of the left, and I think you see that in the results of the elections since 1996. Are we okay with the audio? Um, do you think there's more political participation in the political process uh, now that there is MNP? More participation. I mean, the voting turnout statistics have continued to sort of long run decline. Um, we had very high turnout on the first past post, and we still do. I think it was the last election was 81 percent. Um, in terms of people getting actively involved in political parties, I think that that's followed the universal Western trend of a decline. Um, I think what it's probably done is given people, the ch some people, the chance to participate who wouldn't have done if their only options were, you know, mainstream Labour or National. People who are deep ecologists now can get involved with a political party where they don't feel they have to compromise most of what they believe in. Same with um, fringe neoliberals on the right, they can join ACT. They don't have to worry about being mixed up with moderates or conservatives. So maybe there are some people involved who wouldn't have been, but whether the aggregate numbers are higher, I, I, I doubt it. <clears throat> What about the kids? Uh, yeah, we can hear the kids. Oh, are they? Um, so, do you think there's uh, more political participation in New Zealand now? Under Bitcoin and proportional than there was? No, 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 I don't. But because the aggregate numbers of people involved, whether it's voter turnout or whether it's the number of people who are members of parties, has declined. Um, but some people are involved who wouldn't have been because they can choose parties that are more closely aligned to just what they believe in. When there are sort of eight parties in Parliament, it gives some people choices they wouldn't have had when it was mainly Labour and National. But party membership has, all across the West has declined in aggregate, and so I guess in an activist sense fewer people are involved than were 20 or 30 years ago. <clears throat> um, so do you, think, um, do you think MMP has made politicians more accountable? That's a tricky one. Um, accountable to whom? To the voters. I think it's changed the locus of accountability. In the in the first past post system, you had one politician and one electorate. If the voters didn't like them, they could chuck it out. Um, nowadays, with the party list system, that doesn't work. Voters can ditch a politician. They can still get in on, on their list. But what the system does mean is that 
political groupings in Parliament have to be a little bit more authentic to their principles. It's less easy for them to do what Labour did, say, in the 80s and campaign on a moderate left platform than govern as a right-wing party because people have lots of other options and they can easily go and vote for another party and know that their vote isn't going to be wasted. They're not kind of trapped voting for one of the big parties that's already in Parliament. So on a sort of programmatic level, I think probably the parties are more likely to stay where they are and, and are more likely to follow their values and principles when they're in government than they would have been well, than they would have been tempted to be under first past the post. Would it be a fair analysis to <clears> say that uh, that the party uh, that the voters can hold the parties more accountable and the parties can hold the politicians more accountable? Well, they can hold them more accountable in the sense, again, that they're not trapped with them. Like, there, there's no guarantee of Labour getting votes. Like, in the old days, Labour and National could rely on the fact that they were the only real party that was an alternative to, um, to the other one. But now that doesn't apply. Look at what happened in 2002. National's vote went down to 21%. You'd never have seen it that low under first past the post. National voters who were disaffected with that party could go to New Zealand first, they could go to United Future, they could go to ACT. And so there were, there were options. So I, I guess <clears throat> voters can hold parties more accountable because parties now know that they can catastrophically lose their vote if they aren't doing what they said they would do. Um, when people vote in MPs, do you think they're voting more for the policies of the party or the people in it? I don't think that MMP has changed the sort of presidentialization of New Zealand politics. I think that um, election campaigns are largely fought between personalities, between leaders. <clears throat> I think policy is important in motivating some groups of voters or in setting an overall tone about where people are going. But um, the way the media reports parties is all about the head-to-head -head contest between alternative prime ministerial candidates. Um, a single politician with a single good soundbite can get a lot of votes. Look at United Future in 2002. Please, the focus on policy, no. Mm. Um, how has campaigning and electioneering changed under the campaign? Hugely, because in the old days you might have had 15 seats that were seen as marginal and you want to target the centrist voters in those seats. So you could be down to targeting 10,000 people across the country. <coughs> the great thing about MMP is that everyone's vote counts. And so you've got to be campaigning everywhere. You've got to be looking for those Labour votes in Gore, or in Narawahia, or in, you know, in Epsom, in seats that under first past the post that were a complete dead loss to Labour. The National Party has to actually have a visible campaign presence in South Auckland because there are some votes there. And so it's made the job for political parties a lot harder because they have to target much more broadly and they have to have activist campaigning machines everywhere. You can't ignore any part of the country because there's always the chance of a party vote. You know, even in the rural areas where Labour might only get 20%, in first past post, it didn't matter. Those, you were never going to win the seat. It didn't matter whether those people got out and voted for you or not. But because it's a cumulative total across the country, You've got to go for every vote. So that's meant a fundamental shift in the way resources are deployed in the attention paid to party organisation in seats and areas that aren't seen as strongholds for the political party. Um, is there a problem? No, I'm just my family. Uh, what do you see as the single greatest benefit to arise from MSP? Um, exactly the fact that everyone's vote counts. That no one can sit back and say, my vote doesn't matter in this election because under first past the post in most seats for most people it didn't matter a damn what they did but under MMP with the party vote everyone's vote counts and I think that's a huge benefit because it was just not fair that under the old days even even if you assume that everyone voting for a major party counted still 20% of votes were voting voters were voting for parties that didn't get any parliamentary representation so these days most people's vote counts and every, every vote can count towards changing the government. Yeah, what would have been the greatest drawback? The greatest drawback is that for big parties like mine, like the Labour Party, you've got a campaign everywhere. It was a hell of a lot easier for us when you could just focus your campaign on marginal voters in marginal seats. 
and instead we've got a huge country, very spread out, very diverse communities, and we have to be everywhere. Um, so from a party point of view, that's the biggest difficulty. I guess from a public point of view, the, the biggest drawback would be that there isn't a clear choice. You can't be certain that you're getting rid of a Labour government and putting in a national one or vice versa under an MP because the coalition negotiations aren't always predictable in advance. Look at 96, everyone thought they were getting rid of national and Winston Peters ended up backing them, putting them back in office. Well, do you think people were surprised? Mm. Uh, Winston Peters played it very coyly in the election. I think people were surprised. Um, I mean, I was only in my last year at high school in 96, but my memory of it was that everyone was assuming <laughs> that because Winston had campaigned so hard against National, that he would want to see a change in government. And he didn't, so. Uh, do you think that cost uh, New Zealand subsequent I think it made them pretty unpopular among a lot of the vote that had gone to them in 96, which is why they had, they had 17 seats in the 96, 99 parliament before they disintegrated. And then they were much smaller after the 99 election. Um, and that would have been a consequence of some of their voters feeling betrayed. Um, what modifications have been suggested to the system in order to improve it? Um, I haven't heard any recent proposals for change. Um, in the past, some people have suggested that the threshold needs to be lower. We only need 5% of the vote to get in on the list. Um, some people suggest that should be 4 or 3. Um, another suggestion I've heard is that if the moment if a politician wins a constituency seat, their votes, their party votes, count for their party whether they have 5% or under. Um, and I've heard some people say that that flow over should be broken. So if someone wins a seat, they shouldn't get list seats until they meet the threshold anyway. Um, but I think the system is working well. It's working as it was designed to. It's delivering results that reflect um, what people vote for. Um, and I don't sense any real strong demand for change out there. Do you think uh, that the MNP works in the United States? Oh boy. Um, I think it's difficult to translate into a federal system. Um, it would certainly lead to a breakdown in the Republican-Democrat monopoly on power in the House of Representatives. Um, I, I don't know how that would work when you're dealing still with a presidency that's always going to be a two-party institution um, because it has to choose a single point of executive power. Um, but I do think that one of the flaws of first past the post in the United States is that people's choices are streamed into two choices. You, if you want to make the difference, you either have to vote Democrat or Republican. Um, and the way that the constituencies are drawn up, again, there are not very many electoral districts where your vote actually counts. And the great thing about MMP is it changes that dynamic completely. Every vote across the country counts. Um, I think that the US political powers that be wouldn't want to see it. And I can't see in the US system where um, change could be driven from outside that Republican-Democrat machine that wouldn't want to see the change. Yeah, with Daniel. Um, that's, that's pretty much what I, uh, all I had. Do you have any questions?